In this video, I'd like to show you how some intuition from physics can really help help us solve uh, uh, like mathematical problems or mathematical equations. This is a functional equation, and I think that the intuition from physics here is, is beautiful. And in general, like, I would uh, the motto of this channel is that uh, physics should be taught with uh, math with mathematical rigor, and mathematics should be taught with intuition from physics. So uh, yeah, so so let's see. So we are asked to find all continuous functions from uh, R to R, single variable functions, such that for all x, y that are real, we want f to be defined everywhere, uh, we, would, uh, we would have this equality. So we want to find all the functions here. And so what we can see, at least those who are familiar with physics, is that on the left-hand side, what we have is a special case of a solution to the wave equation. And on the right-hand side, what we have is, uh, well, obviously, because we have an equality, then the right-hand side is also a solution to a wave equation because it equals to, to, this, uh, to this function, which is a solution to the wave equation. And basically, it's looking for a solution to a wave equation uh, in a form of separation of variables. So this f, uh, but it's very special form because uh, it's the same function for x and y, so it's a very special case. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the wave equation, let me just tell you briefly what it is, and uh, uh, I will not go in depth here, but it's something, it's really worth a playlist in its own right. So a uh, wave equation, if we want to describe, basically suppose that we have some string here, it's not necessarily finite or, or fixed at any two ends, and so suppose that the height of the string is, uh, we call it, so here, this is the x-axis, and basically, we, we also need the t-axis, right? T and uh, uh, and here, basically, the u is the height uh, at the point x at time t of, of the string that is oscillating. So uh, at each uh, different moment of, of time, yeah, we can, we can draw it as two variables, or uh, we can draw snapshots of the same string. So uh, Suppose that this is at some uh, time, uh, at z say t equals zero, and then the sna snapshot, snapshot of the same string at later time could be this, right? So for example, this could be t equals one. And so uh, this uxt here, right? This is, this is, for example, for a fixed x, we will see the snapshot of this point on the string as it moves on different times, as it oscillates. And so the equation that describes this, at least for uh, small oscillations for low amplitude oscillations is the following one. So it's the second derivative of u with respect to x equals to the second derivative of u with respect to time. And I also need to add here something. And one over, I will write it one over v squared, where v turns out to be the velocity of the wave. And to those of you who have a hard time to remember where to put the v, so, uh, physics gives us an intuition that dimensions, physical dimensions should match. And so in order for uh, the dimensions to match in the denominator, uh, so here x has uh, dimensions of lengths, uh, or x squared, it's length squared, never mind. So, uh, and here we have dimensions of time. So to convert them, we need dimensions of velocity here. Uh, times, uh, times the time gives us dimensions of lengths. And so if we now look at this equation, and basically what can be easily proved is that for every x and t, uh, so uxt for every, for any two uh, uh, twice differentiable functions, f plus uh, say x minus vt and plus g of x uh, plus vt here, uh, when we have this, then actually if f and g are uh, twice differentiable functions or continuously differentiable, then uh, this is basically a solution to the wave equation. It's a general uh, solution. Uh, and it can be easily verified because if we take the second derivative of u with, with respect to x, it's basically f prime prime at x minus vt, and here plus g prime prime x plus vt. That's the second derivative with respect to x. And when we take the second derivative with respect to t, so basically, uh, from here, uh, uh, the first derivative will have minus v. It's it's the same, and on the second derivative, 
it will be minus v times minus v. It's going to be again v squared f prime prime of x minus uh, vt. And here uh, plus, here it's even easier, v squared g prime prime of x plus vt. And so we see that if we take the second derivative with respect to time divided by v squared, then we get this equality. So this is a solution. So uh, what do we conclude from this? Well, we conclude that if we take the roles uh, we, uh, in this equation, so we have f of x uh, minus y, and here plus f of x plus y uh, equals twice f of x, f of y. So I said at first that f is only continuous, but uh, let us suppose that we're trying to figure out an easier case, and let us suppose for now that f is uh, twice continuously differentiable. And let's see how does this help us. So now this is a valid solution to the wave equations, uh, to the wave equation, and here x plays the roles of x, uh, the velocity is one, and y plays the role of time. And therefore, we could conclude that when we take this side is also a solution, so twice f prime prime of x times f of y has to be equal to twice f of x, f prime prime uh, y. And by the way, what I wanted to say that we're interested in non-trivial solutions. So of course, uh, f equals zero is solution, so we want non-zero solutions, or at least those that are not identically zero, uh, and preferably those for which there isn't at least an interval where f is non-zero. Uh, okay, so uh, supposing this for a moment, we can divide by f here, and then we obtain that f prime prime of x divided by f of x equals to f prime prime of y divided by f of y, and that's a well-known uh, situation in, in, uh, in uh, differential equations, partial and uh, differential equations. So since uh, we have this equality, this is something that depends only on x, this is depends only on y, and the equality has to hold for every x and y, so I can substitute any uh, non value for y such that f of y is non-zero, such supposed to exist, and then this will be some constant. And as a result, uh, the second derivative of x was uh, uh, divided by f of x has to be some constant. Let's say that this constant is lambda uh, or, uh, yeah, or minus lambda, doesn't matter. Uh, so let's say that this constant is lambda. So there has to be some constant. Okay, and what else can we say here? Well, let us study this equation. So uh, let us plug in uh, some values here. So suppose that we plug in zero uh, for x and y, then what we have here is that twice f of zero has to be equal, yeah, it's zero and zero, so twice f of zero equal to twice f of zero squared. And so basically this means that we have only two options for f of zero. f of zero is i is a zero or f of zero is one. That's all our options. And we'll see that this necessarily leads to a trivial solution. Well, why is that? Because if we plug in uh, zero for y, right, let, let us just prove it. Let us plug in a zero for y here, then what we will have on the left-hand side is twice of x. And when we plug in zero for y, and assuming that f of zero is zero, then we obtain that this is zero, which means that f of x is zero, and that's only the trivial solution, of this identically zero function. So, uh, got this case figured out, it's not interesting. So our only uh, interesting option is f of zero equals one. Basically, we must have this. And you know that we need two conditions uh, in order to solve uh, second order partial differential equation. And let us see what do can we say about f, the derivative of f at zero. Uh, so now it will be actually preferable uh, to take the derivative here, but with respect to y, and we'll see uh, y shortly. So. Uh, let us let me write it this way. So let me rewrite it here. So we have f of x minus y plus f of x plus y equals twice f of x, f of y. And so when we take the derivative with, with respect to y, here we're going to have minus, right? Because it's with respect to y. So this internal derivative here of x minus y, and here plus f of x uh, plus y. Nothing changes here. It's just prime here, of course. Uh, and uh, equals to f of x and f prime of y. Okay, and now if we plug in x equals zero and y equals zero, then what we see here, it's f prime at zero uh, and minus f prime at zero, so we have zero, and f of zero, we figured out that this equals to one, so we have that f prime at zero is zero.
well fantastic okay so uh let's see let's see where this leads us so we now have the equation that we have f prime prime of x equals lambda f of x and basically we need to consider only three cases here lambda is greater than zero lambda is uh smaller than zero and lambda equals to zero so when lambda equals to zero let's see if we get uh, a solution here so uh basically if lambda is equal to zero then f of x let's get rid of the zero case then f of x is ax uh, plus b and then we must have that f of zero is one this means uh, that b is one and then uh, f prime at zero is zero and okay so if prime at zero is zero which means that a is zero and so we get the constant solution which is also kind of trivial f of x equals uh, one identically and let's see uh yeah that's that's indeed the solution we, we have one one and one plus one is two okay that's not really interesting so this uh lambda equals zero gives us another trivial solution uh, which is the constant one and so uh now let us see what we uh could have if uh in the case that lambda is uh, greater than zero or uh, lambda is smaller than zero so for this case um, uh, we have here basically it's it's a known solution so uh, for this equation uh, f prime prime uh, of x equals lambda uh, f of x and suppose that lambda is greater than zero then the solution is a well-known solution it's actually uh, e to the power it's some constant a e to the power of square root of lambda x plus some constant b e to the power of minus the square root of lambda and here we would have uh, again x and, and this would be our f of x or if we want we can write it in the following way so lambda is positive here so um, we can write it uh, as follows for some other constant, say c1, we can write it as the, cos, uh, the hyperbolic cosine of the square root of lambda. Let's call it a for um, just for to make it shorter, and plus the second constant, uh, hyperbolic sine of ax. And so we see we must have that f of zero equals uh, one, and f of this would imply that c2 is zero, and f prime of uh, zero is zero and this means that this is uh, yeah let's let's plug it in so f uh, when you plug in zero this is one and this is zero so c1 has to be equal to one and uh, okay so you know let's let's plug it in so uh, f of uh, when we plug in zero here then we're left with this so f of zero equals to c1 because the hyperbolic sign at zero is one, so this has to be equal to one, and then f prime at, uh, let's say x, this is uh, c1 hyperbolic sign of ax times a here, and here plus uh, a c2 cosine hyperbolic of ax, and so we, when we plug in zero, this goes away, and uh, so we basically have that f prime at zero is um, a c two uh, equals to zero, which means that which means that c two is zero unless a is zero and then the solution is constant. So um, one solution that we get is f of x is cosine. Uh, is the hyperbolic sine of a x for for some a uh, that's a solution and in fact we can check then when we plug it in then it satisfies uh with the identity it satisfies the equation and another option which is also uh, uh if lambda is uh smaller than zero then actually in this case the solution is also known and we can write it as a sine plus b cosine so we can write this as a equal a cosine the square root of 
uh, minus lambda, or the absolute value of lambda, uh, times x plus b sine uh, the square root of absolute value of lambda uh, times x. Okay. And basically, uh, from this, we can see that uh, by the same argument, f of x has to be equal uh, cosine, if we call this again a, it's just the cosine of ax. And so in conclusion, all the solutions that to this equation that are twice differentiable are either the constant f of, zero, uh, f of x equals zero, f of x equals identically one, uh, f of x is for some uh, real a, it's the cosine of ax, and f of x is the cosine hyperbolic of ax. And that's all the solutions, at least in the case that f is twice continuously differentiable um, function. But what if f is only continuous? So here, actually, there is a very beautiful argument that was uh, communicated to me by a friend, and he said that he read it in a paper by somebody named Katz. Uh, but he didn't say even uh, the first name of the author. But now we can consider this equation. So we can actually prove for this type of equation that if f is continuous, then in fact f is infinitely many times differentiable. And so let us see how it works. So basically what we can do here is to uh, do the following trick. Let us integrate this f of x uh, minus y in some interval, say, 0 to 1, or an interval where f is defined, let us integrate it with respect to y. And plus uh, the integral of this, uh, integrate it with respect to uh, y again. And here we'll have twice. And uh, here we will have the integral of f of y in the interval 0, 1. Uh, so it's just going to be a constant, say, m. So this is f of x, and this is times some constant. And here's the beautiful part here. So by the argument that, that we have here is that this function, since f is continuous, then uh, we can invoke the fundamental theorem of calculus to prove that this function is actually uh, differentiable, once uh, continuously differentiable. Because uh, y here is a dummy variable of integration. So if we really uh, wish to, to invoke the fundamental theorem of calculus, what we can do here, we can introduce that z as x uh, minus y here because this eventually will be a function of x right and then uh, so uh, we will plug in so what we have here is uh, instead of this we can write integral of f of z and d uh, dz is minus dy so it's going to be minus dz here and so when uh, when y equals zero we have here x and where y equals uh, 1, it's actually x minus 1. And so this could be separated, some point, constant point in between here, uh, x, uh, some constant point that would be in this interval, say c, we can write this as uh, the integral of from x minus 1 to some point, uh, constant point c of f of z, uh, dz, or if we wish, we could say the minus and uh, then plus integral from c to x of f of z dz. And now the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if f is continuous, then this function, sorry, the integral dz here, of course. So this function is, if f is continuous, then this function is differentiable with respect to x, and its derivative is the continuous function that is inside, is the integrand. And the same for this function. We can just flip the, the add the minus signs and flip the, the uh, leave the boundaries. So what we have here is that, that this function, we can say this is some phi of x and phi is continuously differentiable. And this function is, is psi of x. So psi of x is continuously differentiable. And therefore, f of x is a sum of two continuously differentiable functions. And as a result, f of x is continuously differentiable function. So f belongs to class C1. But now we can actually show that f belongs to uh, c infinity. Because when we look at this equation, so actually this uh, function is uh, continuously uh, differentiable once. Uh, and so we could can then, uh, if we look at this equation again, so uh, we have f of x. 
basically we can apply the same argument uh, we don't even need to go any farther because if now f is continuously so we can go back to the same trick of integration so now if f is continuously differentiable once then phi and psi will be twice continuously differentiable and as a result f will be twice but if f is twice then phi and psi are three times continuously differentiable and therefore f is in, 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 in c infinity so f is actually smooth and so the analysis that we did previously is completely valid and as a result we have proved that with some physical intuition that if f is continuous then all the possible solutions to this equation are that are all the possible solutions that are continuous including the trivial solutions are those so i hope that you enjoyed this video i know it was a bit long uh, and you know the connection to physics was a bit vague but i hope that you like it so thank you for watching